Today on Burke Make Stuff, I'm going to show you how I built this gorgeous red oak and hard maple joiners mallet. On one side, we have a leather face to deliver a soft blow, and on the other, we have a little bit more blunt force trauma. But even more importantly to you, I'm going to show you how to get around all the situations, problems, and issues I had while building its prototype. Let's do it now. I started with a ton of research. And that research put a bunch of images and ideas in my head of what I wanted to make. And to get them all out, I thought it would be a smart idea to draw a to scale size model of exactly what I wanted the final product to look like. That way I know what I'm working towards all along. The best thing about drawing something to scale the way you want it is that the measurements you can take directly off of your drawing instead of having to guess and try and hit all of the roadblocks that you normally would. I took the measurements directly from the drawing I made and transcribed them onto the wood that I'm going to use for this project. In this case, I'm going to be using red oak and hard maple, basically because I have it laying around. And since I don't have a huge chunk of hard wood to use, I'm going to be laminating four pieces of wood together. That is, I'm going to glue thin pieces of wood together to make one big thick chunk for the mallet head. We will eventually be using four pieces of laminated wood to make the mallet head, but for now we're going to join together only the two center pieces. Those are the two pieces of hard maple in this case that will eventually be sandwiched between red oak. As you can see, I use a lot of wood glue, and sometimes slippery wood glue can make clamp ups difficult. What I do in these cases is use a little table salt sprinkled on the glue to offer friction to hold everything right where it needs to be. While those dried, I grabbed the two pieces of red oak that are going to be the outside of the mallet head and transcribed all of the measurements and the drawing onto them. That was really just for myself though, I'm a very visual learner and it helped me understand where things are going to go and how they're going to be laid out far better. Since the two middle pieces weren't dry yet, I decided to put a couple of brad nails in to hold them in place while everything dried and so that I could cut this thing in half. I then took each half and marked in an identical angle at the top of each one where they previously met before they were cut. I did this by marking in a quarter inch at the top and then measuring down about a third of the board and making another mark. Now in retrospect, I would have marked in about an eighth of an inch and then a third of the way down the board if I had to do this again, but this is how I did it this time. I then connected all those angles and eventually I'm going to cut those out and here's why. When all is said and done, we're gonna have a handle in between these two center pieces of the mallet head. And into that handle, we're gonna cut two channels into which we are going to slam two wedges and that will force the handle at the top to open up and make a really tight fit in this mallet head, which is exactly what we want. Once I made sure that the handle lines were centered on the piece of red oak, it was time for glue up of the mallet head. I glued the pieces of hard maple on one of the sides of red oak, making sure not to cover the area that the handle would need to go. Reinserting the handle at this point is a really good idea just to make sure your spacing is correct, but be cautious not to get any glue on the handle at all at this point and then you add the final piece of the mallet head before clamping up the head, removing the handle, and leaving it to dry. And while that mallet head is drying, we can put our attention back on the handle that we now need to get made out. Now, I didn't have the right size wood stock to make exactly what I wanted in the picture, but I had what I had, so I made some modifications and moved forward. And not really knowing exactly how to do this because I hadn't done it before, I busted out every file and every rasp I had in the shop and tried to make a dent in this thing. And honestly, it worked really, really well. But after, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes, my arms were burning so bad that I went to power tools. So at that point, I turned to my Dremel 4300, my new purchase. I absolutely love this thing. I've gotten a ton of use out of it already, but even this wasn't making as specific and detailed the cuts that I wanted. So I turned to my table saw and I set the blade nice and low, just high enough to take out the amount of material I wanted from the piece. And then I slid each of the four sides of the handle over it until all the unwanted wood had been cut out. A quick disclaimer on this. Um, even though it's an old rickety saw, I felt very comfortable doing this, but it was very dangerous. And if you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't do it. Okay, back to the video. Now that I wasn't trying to gouge out big portions of material and I was just trying to shape it using the Dremel, this went much smoother and it ended up being really, really nice. Next, I grabbed my random orbital sander and made sure that everything was nice and smooth up to 220 grit. And then I hit it up with some hand sanding up to 320, 
but I kept running into some issues. Totally free of charge, here for you is a bonus hack. One of the problems I find with paper-backed sandpaper is that it's really pretty flimsy for how I like to use sandpaper. So what I often do is I put a piece of tape, in this case gaffer's tape, on the back of it. That way it acts as a secondary support for the sandpaper, and I've never had it rip ever when I do that. Next up is the two-step process of cutting those channels in the top of the handle that we talked about earlier to receive the wedges. The first step is to go over to your drill press and drill in two holes at the base of where those channels are going to be. These two holes will help prevent the handle from splitting when those two wedges are smashed into place. The second step of this, and there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but I took it over to the table saw and raised my blade to the depth of the channel I want to cut. I then ran it through next to the guide, flipped the piece around, and ran it again. This gave me two channels exactly the same distance from center in the piece. At this point, our laminated mallet head was ready to be cut to its final dimensions. So I took it out of the clamps, raised the saw blade to meet where it needed to be, and cut both sides to the final dimensions, making sure to be very careful to be accurate. I then took it over to the miter saw, and using our original picture as a guide, figured out what angles needed to be added to our short sides, and did so. I then used my belt sander to add a chamfer to all of the sides of the mallet head, not just because it looks better, which I think it does, but also because any sharp edges on the mallet when it's used to strike things could create a chip out, and we don't want that. I then took the time to hand sand the mallet head from 120 all the way up to 320, just to make sure it was perfect. Being that this is something I'm going to use in my shop for a long time, I want it to be as good as I can possibly get it. I then grabbed the chisel and carefully removed all the dried glue that was made when we made our, well, I guess technically it's a laminated mortise at this point, before making and prepping the two wedges that we're going to use to finally put this whole thing together. I then inserted the handle into the mallet head, added glue into the channels we cut, put the wedges into them, and then pounded them, and pounded them, and pounded them. And oddly enough, it worked, and nothing exploded. Things fell off the shelf, things broke, but not the mallet, not the mallet at all. Once I had cut off and sanded the excess of the wedges, I applied multiple coats of Minwax Clear Aerosol Spray Lacquer. I love this stuff, it only takes 30 minutes to dry before you can recoat it, and it leaves an excellent finish. Once the lacquer had been given enough time to fully cure, I came back and masked off the section of the mallet head that I wanted to apply the leather to. I love leather. I did this very easily using some Super 77, which is a super sticky spray adhesive, a thick piece of leather that I had from a leftover project, and some nuts and bolts for weight. To cut off the excess leather, I tried an X-Acto knife, but that really didn't get us anywhere with this thick leather. So I turned to another one of my new-ish tools that I keep finding more and more uses for in the shop. It might look like just another pair of scissors, but actually, these are coated in titanium, and I've yet to find anything they can't cut through like butter. They're by a company called Wiss, and were surprisingly inexpensive. There's something so awesome and special about building a tool that you're going to be using on a regular basis. I'm very excited. I can't wait to start using it. I love the way that the hard maple is sandwiched between the red oak. It just has this really wonderful, rich feel to it. I think this came out awesome, and it's wonderfully useful. You should go build one, too. As always, there's affiliate links to all of the materials and the tools that I used in the description below of the video. If you get anything there, of course, it helps the channel a little bit, which would be greatly appreciated and definitely go check out some more of the Burke Make Stuff project videos there's lots of things there that you can build and please understand how thankful I am that you're here with me our community is something that I absolutely cherish and I'm so grateful for I'll see you guys next time